We're going to go to a, quickly here an article from BBC News. Eastern cities under heavy bombardment. This was a couple days ago, so this is already obsolete. It shows, but we have a map here that shows the area around Lysychansk. And it was still under Ukrainian control at this point, and we'll put this up right here on the screen for you. Yeah. But this is now all completely in Russian control. And there we go again. Welcome to Redneck TV, episode number 28 with Kat. And Scott. Today we're going to go back to a subject we've covered heavily a couple months ago. It's kind of fallen by the wayside as far as mainstream media coverage. And that's the war between Russia and Ukraine. There's been a lot of distractions. So we've had Pride Month. We've had the January 6th hearings. Yeah. We've had the trial of Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. Who cares? Nobody. The war still continues. Um, yeah. We're going to read through a blog post by a gentleman named Martin Van Kreveld. And yeah. uh, let me give you a little background on Mr. Van Kreveld. He was born in the Netherlands in the city of Rotterdam to a Jewish family. His parents were staunch Zionists who had managed to evade the Gestapo during World War II. Mm. In 1950, uh, he was born in 1946, so at the age of four, he moved to Israel, um, studied history at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and earned a master's degree. From 69 to 71, he studied history at the London School of Economics and received a PhD. His thesis was titled, Greece and Yugoslavia in Hitler's Strategy. Um, he's pretty much an expert on war. And he's got the credentials here to be a very trustworthy type of gentleman whose um, blog post we're going to explore right now. This is an article, or an, a blog entry actually, from June 30th. And it shows a picture of Russia's Victory Day Parade 2022. Victory Day in Russia is what, May 9th? May 9th, yeah. May 9th. So this is a recent picture. It shows uh, a lot of Red Army soldiers here in uh, Red Square yeah. in front of the mausoleum the, and at the, the historic museum. The, that's, that's the, the historic the, museum. That yeah. he's, the historic museum. We stood right at this spot. That's yes. amazing. Yeah. You got the Kremlin in the background here. There's a yeah. big stage set up. I imagine Mr. Putin spoke. But the title of this is Will Russia Win? And we'll read. Like almost all other Westerners at the time the Russian-Ukrainian war broke out in February 22, I was convinced that the Russians would fail to reach their objectives and lose the war. Putting the details aside, this prediction was based on the following main three pillars. First, the numerous failures after 1945 of modern state-run armed forces to cope with uprisings, insurgencies, guerrilla warfare, terrorism, asymmetrical warfare, and any number of similar forms of armed conflict. Think of Malaysia. Yes, Malaysia, so often falsely claimed by the British as a victory. Think of Algeria. Think of Vietnam. Think of Iraq. Think of dozens of similar conflicts throughout Asia and Africa. Almost without exception, it was the occupiers who lost and the occupied who won. Second, the size of Ukraine's territory and population made me and others think that Russia had tried to bite off more than it could swallow. The outcome would be a prolonged, very bloody, and very destructive conflict that we would be decided not so much on the battlefield, but by demoralization both among Russia's troops and among its civilian population. As indeed happened in 1981 through 1988, when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, 
only to get involved in a lengthy counterinsurgency campaign that ended not just in military defeat on the ground, but in the disintegration of the Soviet Union. This line of reasoning was supported by the extreme difficulty the Russians faced before they finally succeeded in bringing Chechnya, a much smaller country, to heel. Yeah. Third, plain wishful thinking. Something I shared with most Western observers, including heads of state, ministers, armed forces, intelligence services, and the media. Since then, four very eventful months have passed. As they went on, the following factors have forced me to take a second look at the situation. First, the Ukrainians are not fighting a guerrilla war. Instead, as the list of weapons they have asked the West to provide them with shows, they have been trying to wage a conventional one. Tank against tank, artillery barrel against artil artillery barrel, and aircraft against aircraft. All apparently in the hope of not only halting the Russian forces, but of expelling them. Given that the Russians can fire 10 rounds for every Ukrainian one, such a strategy can only be a sure recipe for defeat. Second, a change in Russian tactics. Greatly underestimating their enemies, the Russians started the war by attempting a coup de main against the center of Ukrainian power at Kiev. When this failed, it took them some time to decide what to do next. They may even have replaced a few of their top-ranking generals. But then they regrouped and switched to the systematic reduction of Ukrainian cities and towns, much as in 1939-40 Stalin and his generals did to Finland. As in both that war and World War II as a whole, they resorted to what has traditionally been their most powerful weapons, for example, massed artillery. It now appears that the change enabled them to reduce their losses to levels that they can sustain for a long time, perhaps longer than the Ukrainians who, by Zelensky's own admission, are losing as many as one to two hundred of their best fighters killed in action each day. Wow. That's a lot. Third, Western military technology, especially anti-aircraft weapons, anti-tank weapons, and drones may be excellent. However, limited numbers, the result of years and years of parsimony and the belief that war in Europe has become impossible, plus the need to retrain the relevant Ukrainian personnel, means that it has been slow to arrive in the places where it is most needed. Not to mention the fact that, whereas the Russians are fighting close to home, NATO lines of communication stretch over hundreds of miles all the way from Ukraine's border with Poland, Slovakia, and Romania in the west to the Donbass in the east. Almost all the terrain in between is flat, devoid of shelter, and thinly populated, meaning that it is ideal for the employment of air power, precisely the field in which Russian superiority over Ukraine is most pronounced. Fourth, Strict censorship is making the impact of Western economic sanctions on Russia's population hard to assess. If there is any grumbling, it is being energetically suppressed. Meanwhile, a look at the macroeconomics seems to show that Russia is coping much better than many Westerners expected. Gold reserves have been inching up, enabling Putin to link his currency to gold, the first country to do so since Switzerland went in the opposite direction back in 1999. The ruble, which early in the war came close to collapse, is back to a seven-year high against the dollar, trend upward. Given the fall in imports as well as the tremendous rise in energy prices, more money is flowing into Russia's coffers than ever before. Most of that money comes from selling energy, foodstuffs, and raw materials to countries such as China and India. China, in turn, is now the world's number one industrial power. Once its current troubles with COVID-19 are over, it should be well able to provide Russia with almost any kind of industrial product it needs and do so for a long time to come. I think that Putin's move of tying the Russian ruble to a gold standard is crucial in this equation. Yeah, it's like um, a joker of sorts. Yeah, a wild card. Yeah, it is. Because, I mean, at the same time, if we look, you know, at the West at an, at, and at our own country, we see the opposite. 
Yeah, and that's what's that causing right now in the United States other than massive inflation? Yes, massive inflation, redistribution of wealth through inflation because apparently whatever wealth people had during the Trump era is now just drained out through inflation and shrinkflation as well. Sure. Um, that same box of cornflakes that used to be 18 ounces is now 16 ounces and they raised the price 20 cents. Yeah. So, uh, I'm thinking rather, you know, like I'd like a, we were talking about this earlier. I think what essentially happened is that the Western elites, they have tried to bite off a piece that was too large for them to chew. Yeah. In their attempt to uphold and to support the Ukrainian oligarchs and the Ukrainian elite. It doesn't pan out very well, it seems. Millions and millions and millions of dollars going to Ukraine. I'm wondering, where does that money eventually gonna show up? Right. It's always a good question. You can get any ideas? Oh. This guy had to mow his lawn while we're doing a video. Once again, folks, we're sorry about this. Yeah. So that we wouldn't have to yell. Hopefully. I mean, I didn't expect this guy to go. Yeah, it's almost dark and this guy's got to mow his lawn just because we got to do a video, you know? Yeah, damn. But anyways, so uh, I think uh, the Western elites have underestimated Putin. Very much so. And uh, what this guy was writing about in his blog post about the Westerners and their bias, I think got exacerbated by the fact that all of the Western media unanimously basically started to uh, shriek about that Putin is mentally ill, he is probably having Parkinson's, or he's crazy, or like who does stuff like that, and blah blah blah. And I don't think that Putin is crazy at all. I don't know, I think he's brilliant actually. Actually um, brilliant. There's another point I want to tie in here when they were mentioning the alliance between Russia and China. Um, maybe a lot of people have not heard the term BRIC countries. Um, I'm sure everybody's heard of NATO, but the people that aren't aligning with NATO are busy forming their own alliances right now. And you, you yeah. should really keep an eye on those. One of them is the BRIC countries. BRIC stands for Brazil, Russia, India, and China. That's Can a... you imagine the mass firepower of those four countries combined? Let me read this short article here about the BRIC countries, and then we'll get back to the blog post. Uh -huh. I just want to tell people about the BRIC here. BRIC is an acronym used to refer to Brazil, Russia, India, and China, countries which are considered to be at the same level of newly advanced economic development. Today they are referred to as BRICS after the controversial addition of South Africa in 2010. Uh-huh. This is not one group of little countries in one place. It's, you know, it's yeah. A, it's a global alliance. Here. Those are not little countries. There are arguments that Indonesia should be included in the grouping, which would make it BRIIC or BRIICS. How and why did the concept of BRIC develop? The term was coined in 2001 by Jim O'Neill, who was the then head of global economics research at the investment bank Goldman Sachs. You heard of them. Ah, yeah. The acronym became ubiquitous in popular usage, being seen as a symbol of the shift in global economic power from developed G7 economics towards the developing world. Jim O'Neill projected that the BRIC countries would overtake the G7 economies by 2027. And I think Mr. Neil is a little off. I think it's going to be a couple years before that. Yeah. It looks like that. Like Actually. now. Yeah. General stats of the BRIC countries. You ready for this? This is going to blow your mind. Regarding area, Brazil is fifth in the world. Russia's first, India is seventh, and China is third. Population size, Brazil is fifth, Russia is ninth, India is second, and China is first. Nominal gross domestic product, Brazil is seventh, Russia is tenth, India is seventh, and China is second. Human Development Index, well, this one won't surprise you that these numbers are low. Yeah. Brazil is 85th, Russia is 55th, India is 114th, and China is 101st. Imports, Brazil 21st, Russia 17th, India is 8th, and China is 2nd. 
foreign exchange reserves. Brazil is eighth, Russia is sixth, India is ninth, and China is first. Unsurprisingly so. Electric consumption. Brazil is ninth, Russia is third, India is fourth, China is first. Renewable resources. Brazil is third, Russia is fifth, India is sixth, and China is first. Global phones. Brazil is third, Russia is fifth, India is second, China is first. Do you see where we're going here? Yes. We are being dominated by this global alliance that nobody's yep. ever heard of. Yep. And it's only going to get worse. And nobody's talking about it. All right. Back to Mr. Van Creevelt's blog post. We had done the fourth uh, fourth item here. We're going to go to fifth. The economic economic impact of the war on the West has been much greater than anyone thought. Saving Ukraine from Russia's clutches is not like doing the same with Afghanistan. On both sides of the Atlantic, inflation is higher than it has been at any time since 1980, especially in regards to energy, which Russia is refusing to provide Europe with. It is giving rise not just to confusion, but to some real hardship. Should it continue, as it almost certainly will, it will give rise to growing popular discontent with the war and demands that their country's involvement in it be reduced or brought to an end. Even if that end means abandoning Ukraine and allowing Putin to have his way with it. I mean, that's, that's a very, what? very real scenario. It is. When you look at social media in the United States three months ago compared to what you're seeing today, and in mainstream media coverage, Warren, Ukraine gets a little tiny mention. Yeah. But the January 6th hearings are all over everywhere. Oh, right. Yeah. It's almost like... Johnny Depp, I mean... Oh, yeah, that's so important. I mean, seriously. Freaking Pride Month. Is anybody in the mainstream media talking about Brick? Nope. Nobody. They're scared. Even though that's like a looming, huge, catastrophic front kind of shelf you, cloud on you the think horizon. Somebody would ask us how we got underneath that shelf cloud. <laughs> yeah. How did we get behind? What was the cause? Is anybody asking these questions? These no. are crucial questions they to are. analyze. They are. We're more concerned with pronouns and rainbow colored flags. Yeah. All right. Last but not least, beginning with the Enlightenment, the West has long preened itself on being a fortress where liberty, law, and justice prevail. Now, with the repeated, highly publicized requisitioning of the property of so-called oligarchs, is beginning to make some people wonder. First, no one knows what an oligarch is. The second, the fact that some oligarchs have been in more or less close touch with Putin over the years does not automatically turn them into criminals. Third, supposing they are criminals, it is not at all clear why they were left alone for so long and only began to be targeted after the war broke out. Could it be that, in combating the oligarchs, the West is undermining the justice of its cause? To be sure, we are not there yet, but its growing number of statements that the war is going to be a long one show, it is now primarily a question of who can draw the deepest breath and hold out the longest. And when it comes to that, Russia's prospects of coming out on top and obtaining a favorable settlement are not at all bad. What do you think about the Western involvement of this war? What do you think would be the wisest thing to do for the West right now? Objectively. I would like to say cut their losses now. Mm-hmm. How many more billions of dollars are we going to put into a losing war? How much more strain is that going to put on Western economies? When do we start to look out for the United States economy? In all I this, don't know. In all this. I mean, you can't be printing money all the time. Yeah. Money that has no value. Do you remember I had this theory that maybe uh, the value, since the U.S. dollar is decoupled from the gold standard, maybe the value is being attached... Uh, through running this money to, you know, foreign causes like the, like Ukraine. It's not the first time we've heard about money laundering in Ukraine, is it? Yes. It's not the first time. Because what I'm worried about right now... Which 
I'm waiting for that guy to, to cycle, yep. to yep. cycle back. What I'm worried about right now is that um, the West is going to crash itself against Russia. Not only against Russia, but what's happening basically is that the West, the collective West, is driving Russia further into further integration with India and China, so that builds up some resilience uh, in the BRIC bloc, right? They're only getting started in what they can do yes. economically against the yes. rest of the world. They're only getting started. And now yeah. that Putin has uh, coupled the Russian ruble with gold, that's a loser. That's an absolutely losing situation for the West. For the U.S. dollar, it's going to come down and it's going to be horribly embarrassing uh, because the U.S. dollar is risking right now to cease to be a global currency. The ruble can easily occupy that space. Or the Chinese, what, what is their currency? Yen. Or, yen, yeah, yen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They can easily overtake that because there will come a point in time when the U.S. dollar will be so inflated who is going to stop inflation? How, how are they going to do it? They don't seem to have any kind of plan. Yeah, under these current ongoing yeah. circumstances, who is going to and how is going to stop the inflation? By virtue of what? The only plan for the Biden administration seems to be keep pumping money into Ukraine. Let's send more money to Ukraine. Yeah. So here's what I think what is very likely to happen. If this continues the way it goes on right now, if the West continues its involvement in Ukraine, uh, the crash of Western economies and the Western elites, uh, civil unrest, and potentially might be a... a um, collapse of the Western um, globalist order is going to happen a lot sooner than later. I think we're going to run into some serious difficulties this fall with the harvest. Um, we've had a fertilizer shortage yeah. all year long, which is going to affect the amount and number of crops grown, which is going to affect the harvest, which is going to further deplete the food banks. Um, the supply chains are going to collapse even further. Yeah. Gasoline is going to continue to rise. And by fall, we're going to be in some serious trouble. Yeah. And we have no plan to recover. And the Brandon administration is out of working on it. You know, right now it looks to me that it's like it's like absolute insanity. Like the people who are running this operation, they're probably thinking that, I mean, they're probably not feeling that anything's going to hurt them because they're just filling their pockets, whatever, in yeah. the moment. Yeah. But there are going to be consequences and they're going to start kicking in more and more. But most importantly, whatever is happening right now in Ukraine and all the U.S. sanctions, Western sanctions, European sanctions on Russia are not doing anything. Instead of weakening Russia, it appears that they're actually strengthening Russia. There's been creditors. Um, Russia has defaulted on a bunch of credit situations with, with uh -huh. foreign countries that they've traded with. The creditors of those countries cannot recover their losses from Russia because of the sanctions that are imposed on Russia. There's nobody that can even declare these loans in default because of the sanctions in place. It's a totally crazy, ironic situation. Yeah, it's insane. Let's uh, look at a couple other points here, just to back up uh, Mr. Van Krivelt's statements here. Um, yesterday, um, Russia captured the Ukrainian city of Lysychansk. Lysychansk. Thank yeah. you. Um, this has been an ongoing battle. This was the one spot in the Luhansk province that was still under Ukrainian control. It fell yesterday. Russia now occupies and controls all of Luhansk. Um, after heavy fighting for like Lysychansk, the defense forces of Ukraine were forced to withdraw from their occupied positions and lines, the Army General Staff said yesterday. Earlier, Russia's defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, said his forces had captured Lysychansk and taken full control of the Luhansk region. Ukraine's troops were outgunned there. It said the Russians had multiple advantages in artillery. Yeah. Mr. Van Krivel yeah. was saying aircraft manpower and other forces. 
Um, we're going to go to a, quickly here an article from BBC News. Eastern cities under heavy bombardment. This was a couple days ago, so this is already obsolete. It shows, but we have a map here that shows the area around Lysychansk. And it was still under Ukrainian control at this point, and we'll put this up right here on the screen for you. Yeah. But this is now all completely in Russian control. It uh, describes Russians' invasion of Donbass region. There's some maps here. There's a little blog about uh, Russian forces that have seen big losses. When this is BBC, so they're gonna. Yeah, of know, course they're gonna exaggerate. They're gonna things, put their yeah. two cents in, but yeah, you can see clearly if we're about halfway down the page now. There's a map, and in the red here, you can see all the kind of the territory controlled by Russia going all the way up to the border with is that Belarus there? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's Belarus. Through Luhansk, down, down through. Uh, Donetsk province through Mariupol and continuing down along the Sea of Azov all the way to Crimea and we'll give you a little better shot of that in the next map we'll put it up there now everything south of Zaporizhia and all the way from Kherson all the way up through the border to Belarus is under Russian control Well, it's not quite to the border of Belarus, sorry. That's Russia there. Yeah. My fault. But still, yeah, that's yeah. a sizable chunk. Now, uh, we're going to continue on here. A little article from The Guardian. This is also a British news outlet. It says, uh, Russia-Ukraine war. Ukrainian forces retreat from Lysychansk as Russia claims strategic city. There's some pictures here. Ukrainian Defense Ministry spokesperson has denied Moscow's claims that the city of Lysychansk is under full control of Russian forces. But then it goes on to say, speaking to Sky News earlier, former British Chief Army Chief Lord Danat said meaningful negotiations could arise out of Russia's potentially fully taking control of Ukraine's Luhansk and Donetsk provinces. His comments came before the Russian Defense Ministry reportedly claimed to have taken full control of Lysychansk the last major Ukrainian stronghold in the region. Following early defeats in its invasion, Russian troops have been focused on driving Ukrainian forces out of the region in recent weeks. They're relying on their huge superiority in artillery, and once they've almost reduced everything to rubble, then sending their troops in to take possession of it. There's some more from this gentleman here, but we're going to move on. It's getting late. Uh, and I think that's all I got, really. I just wanted to show those maps and read up that little follow-up article. I think um, Mr. Van Creveld is brilliant. He's a war strategist. Um, he knows a lot more about history, and especially in Europe, than I would ever dream to imagine. I'm going to think his assumptions here, not even assumptions. His, uh, his ideas here are correct. Well, I also think that, you know, it's important that Van Krivelt, he's not a fan of Russia at all. No, there's absolutely no ties to Russia. Yes. So, uh, to hear an analysis like this from a man like Van Krivelt, that means something. This is a man that knows what it's like to be repressed by an authoritarian dictatorship. Yes. His family fled the Nazis in World War II. Yeah. Uh, he's not going to jump on the next dictator that comes along thinking there's going to be anything good to come out of it. Yeah. But he's calling it like he sees it, and he knows what he's seen. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know, as far as I'm concerned, I don't know, nothing is going to change to the better. I don't know, I'm kind of hoping, you know, something might start to change um, when the midterms hit in this country. Well, there's one other point I can relate to here, too. Well, in this country, yes, you're right. I hope that too. Uh, I can't. Let me just summarize from my memory. I can't find that paragraph right now. But it, it's being said that um, this war is going to continue for a long, long time until Russia is going to continue to push on into Donetsk province 
it's going to be a long bloody battle but there's nothing really that's going to change the outcome from what happened in Luhansk it's going to be the same thing once they get to that point both sides may be very well depleted yes. as far as um, manpower weaponry and motivation Yes. And I think at this point we're going to start to see some serious negotiations between Russia and Ukraine. I think it's incumbent upon President Zelensky to bring peace to his country. Yeah. And he may not want to concede that he's lost these provinces that were separatist and wanted to join Russia to begin with. But I think it's incumbent upon him unless he wants this to continue for years and years and years. Well, I yeah. think Russia has the capability to drag it out that long. Yes. I don't, but I don't think they want to. That's yeah, my I, opinion. I, I think so too. I think you're correct, actually. Yeah. Uh, actually, that would be the best thing. It would. I mean, we've talked about when this thing just started. Remember, we're talking about that it would have been a lot better if Zelensky actually upheld the Minsk agreements, right, and didn't let all of this happen. But no, Zelensky didn't want to uphold the Minsk agreements. He violated them, just brushed them off, and then you have the war. And it goes on, and it goes on, and goes on. And of course, it is indeed incumbent on him to step up for his country, for Ukraine, and yeah. put an end to it. It's time to start rebuilding. Yeah. I mean, the, there's, the NATO countries are already looking. There's a conference going on right now in Sweden, I believe. Where they're talking about reconstruction of Ukraine. Yeah. Somebody's got to end the war first. Yes. They're putting the cart before the horse a little bit here. Yeah. I think instead of telling Zelensky how we can rebuild your country, they should be telling him how to end the war. Yep. Or telling him to end the war. Yes. Not even how to. Let him choose how to. Yeah, because... I think just, it's an obvious choice. Yes, because the further it's going to drag on, the worse it's going to become for Ukraine. Yeah actually Absolutely. and it's going to be much worse for ukraine than for russia i think the west needs to realize that all their pumping of military aid and weapons and all this aid to ukraine is not helping anything at this point either it isn't it isn't it's only prolonging the inevitable for the ukrainian people yes plus yes when kribble made made this point about that there is no guerrilla warfare going on the Ukrainian population is not resisting, really. How can they? They can't. They're, they're so outnumbered. They're out, like they said, one round to ten from Russia. Yeah. You know, and I mean, even if they wanted to... You can't to, sustain that kind of activity. I mean, if the Ukrainian people had the resolve to uh, resist Russians at all costs, but it doesn't appear to be the case, you know? It, doesn't, it just doesn't seem... Fortunately, I think, fortunately enough, it doesn't seem that that's the case. Otherwise, it would have been a lot worse. You know, the losses would have been a lot worse for Ukrainians. I think a lot of people are still not quite clear on Putin's objectives in going into Ukraine to begin with. I had somebody say to me today, I stand with Ukraine. I'm like, really? Uh, why? Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Well, because war is wrong. Okay, well, what about Ukraine killing their own people for the last uh, eight years? Yes. You want to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, war is wrong. I mean, we can agree on that one. But, like, and what are your motivations? Can you explain why exactly do you stand with Ukraine? With whom? With the Ukrainian people? Or do you stand with Zelensky, yeah. who is a Ukrainian swamp creature? I think some people are still looking at the, uh, you know, the original Russian push into Kiev and thinking they failed to take Ukraine so that that means Ukraine is winning right now you know <laughs> and I don't see that I don't afraid, see it I'm afraid people don't exactly understand what's going on there and that's in part why are we making this video right um, we'd love to hear your comments we're gonna wrap it up at this point it's starting to get dark out really beautiful dark. night though gorgeous yeah. we got a nice sliver moon up here we want to mention southern caracal as usual skin health and aromatherapy yeah we got lots of great soaps lotions lip balms new soaps and new lotions yes cougar shooky cougar shooky yes 
Cougar Shuki is the new lotion. Also peppermint and also Renfro Valley. Check those out. We're going to put the link uh, or the website address right down here for you. Yes. There's a link down in the description. I want to thank you all for watching Redneck TV with Kat. And Scott. If you like our content, I'd encourage you to subscribe to my channel here. And don't be afraid to smash the heck out of that bell so you get notified for all our videos. We appreciate you all. Really wishing you a happy 4th of July. I hope everybody has a good one out there. Yes, and with that being said, uh, God bless and have a wonderful day. Take care, y'all.